All right, hello. And welcome to our presentation on taxes and retirement. Uh, my name is Tim Dorman, and my firm is actually Eagle Ridge Wealth Advisors. We're the ones presenting today, obviously. Okay, now what we have here too to start the presentation is a couple of people that are summiting Mount Everest, right? And for those of you that don't know, Mount Everest is actually the highest or tallest mountain in the world, right? It's about 29,032 feet. And <clears throat> if any of us have ever been on a commercial flight, I'm sure most of us have, the plane when we're at altitude flying from wherever we're trying to go, we are between 30 and 35,000 feet usually, right? So the, the peak of this mountain is up there with that. Now the the analogy, I love this analogy because we spend our whole lives accumulating and building a nest egg, right? We're, we're summiting the proverbial retirement mountain. We're trying to summit that, summit our career, and then we retire, and then coming down the proverbial mountain is totally different than ascension or accumulation phase, right? It's the same thing with summiting Mount Everest. And what people don't realize is that three out of four people that actually die climbing Mount Everest actually perish on the way down the mountain. And it's very similar with retirement. Our tax code is set up in a very confusing way. And it's in a way that makes it confusing in, in order to get more of your taxes, siphon more of your taxes out of your nest egg in retirement. And you have to work, you want to work with a retirement income specialist that knows every day what's going on. And that's what we do every day. We help people retire, right? We specifically help retirees because we want to have a niche to focus on. And that is our niche, you know, making sure that people retire in the most efficient way that they possibly can without getting hosed in taxes, right? Because I always say you want to pay every cent that you owe Uncle Sam, but you never, ever want to leave him a tip, right? Why pay one penny more than you absolutely have to? Okay. Now, in your life, too, you're going to have some big money decision moments, right? Maybe you get married, maybe you buy a house, maybe you have kids. But retirement is arguably the biggest change of your life because you have to take your nest egg and you have to turn it into an income stream in retirement. And you want to do that in the most efficient way possible. All right. A little bit about me. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here because you're not here to learn about me, right? But um, I have always been interested and how to make money work for me, right? And of course, that led to me eventually wanting to help other people make their money work for them. And then, of course, led to wanting to help people turn their nest egg into a retirement without getting hosed in taxes. And that's what's led us all here today, right? And then also at my firm, we have uh, Maggie, who is a CFP, certified financial planner like me, and a CPA as well. So she's actually <clears throat> got a ton of uh, financial experience herself. And she's a great planner. And then we have Dawn, who is fabulous. She's a client service associate. And she actually has a degree in accounting as well and uh, an MBA. So between us, we've got between 50 and 60 years of financial experience um, at our small boutique firm, which helps people retire every single day. A brief introduction to me. Now, the agenda for today. So before we can talk about solutions, we have to recognize what the problem is, right? So... Also, too, you know, I, I call this taxes 101, 201, and then some stuff that maybe some concepts that you can take home or apply on your own. Um, some of the stuff you're probably going to need help with, even if you understand it, and we're going to go into that. But everybody's knowledge level, level is different. Maybe you know all the stuff in 101. Um, there's probably something you, you haven't thought about because our tax law is changing all the time, right? Certainly with the Secure Act 2.0 again this year. Um, but anyway, just hang in there because we're probably going to get to some stuff that you have not thought about in this presentation as it moves along. Also, I love to offer these complimentary tax visits for people that attend these workshops. Now, what exactly is that? Well, I'm going to cover a couple things. If you click, first of all, on the, the handout tab on the top right, it's going to have a little workbook, Taxes and Retirement Workbook. And if you're next to your printer, go ahead and print that out because it's going to have a guide of stuff that you can print out and follow along and take notes as we go along throughout today. And there's also going to be some tax guides, which is just information basically on this year's thresholds and tax rates and so on and so forth. Very straightforward. And then it's going to have some sample tax reports and tax maps. And that is what, if you sat down and went through a tax visit with us, that is what you would receive, right? And a lot of times, the, I love it when people show up to these because they're more action takers rather than procrastinators, right? Because procrastinators, a lot of times are sitting on a tax bomb and they don't even know about it. And we're going to go, we're going to get into that. What do I mean by that? But 
a lot of times people are like, okay, well, what's the next step from here? How do I take this information that I'm going to learn today and apply it to my life? Well, in that 30 minute visit, basically what you're going to get is a one on one conversation with a highly trained fiduciary, which will probably be myself unless I'm too busy. And then I'll probably have you meet with um, Maggie, but it'll, more than likely it's going to be me. And in that visit, we're going to basically just have a little chat. And then if you want us to build you a personalized tax report and a, and a, and a financial summary, we will. Because in order for you to figure out where you want to go or how you're going to get to where you want to be, you have to know where you're at, right? And that is the purpose of this entire meeting is to figure out where you are, right? And then if you know where you want to go, or maybe you need a little help with that too, but then we say, okay, well, here's your options. And we go from there. But this is completely complimentary, very low pressure. We're not going to try to sell you anything. My firm doesn't sell anything unless you want to call a financial plan itself a sale. We don't sell anything, right? Okay. Oops. Not sure what I did there. Skip forward a little bit. All right. Taking her back. All right. Also, there's a couple questions. If you could, um, something brought you guys to this workshop today, right? And I want to make sure that all your questions get answered. There's going to be a Q&A box. The chat is disabled, but there's going to be a Q&A box that you can talk in and uh, send questions into and we can respond to you in that. Now, also, I want you to know that we are the only ones that can see that. Obviously, you can see and hear me. I cannot see or hear any of you, even though there's quite a few of you on the call today. But go ahead and you can chat into that box and we can chat back. So we're not our Q&A box, not the chat box. That's been disabled. But if you would, I want you to answer two questions. First of all, are you retired? And if you're not, how close do you think you are to retirement? And any detail or color that you could add to that would be great. Like, hey, Tim, I'm an engineer, or I've been working here for you know 40 years, and I'm going to retire in a year or two, or you know anything like that. And then second, what questions do you have today, or what are you hoping to cover? What are you hoping that I'll cover, or hoping that you will learn? All right. Okay. Now I want to start with our top tax rate historically. Uh, first of all, many of you probably don't know this, but we actually did not have an income tax, uh, federal income tax, until 1913. So it's only been around for a little about 110 years, right? <clears throat> we actually had to pass an amendment in order for us to have an income tax. And in the first, when we first passed it, there was seven brackets like there are today. There's seven different brackets, right? But the rates were way different. They were one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? And wouldn't that be great if that's what they still were, right? But a lot's changed since then, right? At that time, most people were still living on farms and so on and so forth. But and, and to have the equivalence of to be in the 7%, the top bracket back then, you would have to make the equivalence of $11 million a year in today's dollars. So like I said, a lot has changed, right? And then, of course, it very quickly rose and got up to almost 80%. And then we had the Great Depression. As you can see, it dropped back down. And then we have World War II. And in World War II, we were actually, for every dollar we were bringing in, we were spending a dollar eight. So they're like, hey, we need to get our government, our tax revenue back up. Um, and then so they raised the top rates back up to 90 percent, actually the top tier and ended up being their effective rates were over 90 percent. Right. <clears throat> and it was that way for a few decades. And then um, it dropped down to around 70, 70 percent for a little bit. And then in the 80s, it dropped down to 40 uh, percent. And then so the last maybe three or four decades, it's been right around that. Our top tax rate has been right around 40 percent. Right. But something I, I want you to think about is that today our tax rates are as low as they've been in 100 years since since the Great Depression, basically. But for every dollar that we're bringing in today, we're spending about a buck twenty five, a buck thirty. So big difference. Right. So remember that for later on in the presentation. OK, now let's go into the problem. Right. A lot of times what happens when people come and, and talk to us is that they're sitting on something that looks like this. They've got a little bit maybe in a tax-free account. They've got a little bit in an after-tax account, but they have a lion's share of their retirement in a pre-tax account, maybe an IRA, a 401k, 403b, whatever it might be, right? And the question is how a lot of times when people approach retirement, you know, they think, how am I going to, I need to change my investment risk profile, right? I'm getting close to retirement. Maybe I should have a little bit more bonds, a little bit more treasury, so on and so forth. So they always think about de-risking from an investment standard. But have you ever considered that you have to de-risk from the IRS or from a tax perspective, right? And that is, you know, 70, 80% of advisors still today are not doing tax planning. 
And that's just a big miss. And, and they're not doing their clients any any justice in doing that. But what they need to be doing, what we do and what this presentation is about is laying the tax code on top of your retirement income situation and make sure you're doing it in the most efficient manner possible. Yes, investments are extremely important, but laying the tax code on top of that is also extremely important. And it's a lot, you know, we can actually show you how we can move the needle with that, right? A lot of times with investments, if you're diversified and not taking a ton of risk, which you probably shouldn't be doing in retirement anyway, if you're relying on your nest egg, then laying the tax code on top of that can, you know, really move the needle with most retire with, with most retirees. And certainly if you're sitting on this problem, right, where a lion's share of your nest egg, or even if it's not the lion's share, if you have a big pre-tax account at all, you're sitting on what we call a tax bomb. And again, I'm going to go in, into that more. But the biggest thing to remember is you need to de-risk from, de from an investment perspective, but you also need to de-risk from a tax perspective because whether or not you knew it, you were making a tax decision all along when you were saving for retirement, building a nest egg. Okay, so a lot of times, like as I mentioned, you get to this position in, in your life, you, you've summited the proverbial retirement mountain. Right. And now you're kind of kind of go more into protection than you've ever been, you know, and hopefully your pile of money is as big as it's ever been in your life. Right. Because you've you've summited that amount. So it's probably close to it right now, even if it's not. Maybe it's come down a little bit, uh, but it's probably close to as high as it's ever been. So, again, now we need to start thinking about how do we de-risk from a tax perspective, because often and, I, and this is the theme for the day, I want you to remember this. Often your tax rate in retirement is going to be determined more by where your income comes from rather than your actual income itself, right? So again, when you're coming down that proverbial retirement mountain, you have to think about where that's coming from, right? Because three out of four people that are coming down Mount Everest actually die on the way down, right? And just like that, like the accumulation phase of just socking money away and putting it into your, you know, your accounts. And just, that's a lot easier. It's a lot more of like, okay, I just need to do this, do this, do this, follow the, you know, do what everybody's telling me coming down the mountain, totally different because you're going to have income coming from all different directions, different types of places. So security, maybe a pension, um, your three different types of accounts, pre-tax, after-tax and uh, your Roth accounts, which of course are your tax-free accounts. And those are your best accounts. I'm going to get into that but it's gonna have a huge effect on your actual tax rate. And that's what we're gonna cover again today. <clears throat> also, I wanna to say too, that we do tax planning at my firm. Um, we do coordinate now with some of our clients and do tax preparation as well, but we do not do, not do that in-house, but we like to know what's going on with that situation and work with the tax preparers. So we do take care of that for some of our clients, just depends on everyone's situation. But the difference is a tax preparer or a CPA is going to look at your results for that year and back. Decisions that have already been made. Every single year, they're going to be like, hey, we need to do this, this, and this to keep your tax rate as low as we can this year. What we do is we're going to look at over the next 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years of your retirement and say, this is what we're going to do to keep your lifetime tax liability as low as we possibly can. It's totally different. And I know this for a fact because a lot of, and nothing against CPAs are fabulous, right? Tax repairs, CPAs, they're doing a great job but they're so busy doing returns or audits or whatever they're doing, they don't have time for tax projections, right? That's why we have a, that's why I have a firm, right? That's why I have a business to help clients. This is a totally different thing, but that gets, that gets a very confusing in our field. But what we're going to do is sand off the rough edges of your lifetime tax liability. And I know this for a fact because I just met a couple months ago with a CPA He'd done tax returns for 20 years. And a lot of the stuff that I brought up that I'm going to cover today, he had never even considered. Because he's just looking at that year for all him and all his clients. How do I save taxes this year? You know, how he wasn't even looking forward. And he, I raised all these questions. He's like, God, I can't believe I've never even thought of this. Right. So anyway, we're going to get into that. Right. All right. Taxes 101. How do they work? So everybody always thinks it's relatively intuitive. Right. If you're not familiar with your tax code, with our tax code, and why would you? Right. Because it's not fun. I mean, I do want this presentation to be one of the best professional presentations that you watch or see this year. But yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not crazy. I don't, even though I want to be very good at this and take very good care of my clients and I'm very passionate about it, I know it's not an exciting topic, 
right? But it can really move the needle. So I hope this has somewhat of an impact for you um, at the very least. And if we should com communicate further or you definitely should take the opportunity to set up that tax clarity visit, do it, right? Because again, you have to know where you're at in order to get to where you want to be, right? But I understand this is not exciting stuff. And also, as I mentioned, you know, everybody's different, has a different level of knowledge, right? But everybody always thinks it's relatively intuitive. I mean, I've got this amount of income, I'm in this bracket. That's not always what is going to happen. And I'm going to go and I'm going to show you why. <clears throat> so first of all, our seven bracket system, right? Just like in 1913, uh, we have seven brackets, but the rates are not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven anymore. It's a 10, 12, 22, 24, so on and so forth. You can see all the way up to 37%. So like I said, in theory, everybody thinks they're in that bracket. That's what they're going to pay, right? Um, and then here is just the same brackets, but they're actually laid out um, the rise and run because the rise and run of our system is totally different, right? So you go from 10 to 12, that's not a big jump. But then you go from 12 to 22, that's a big jump. And the the magnitude, how how wide the the run is. Like if someone's getting, you're going to have a carpenter build this, you know, and he built some stairs for you on a deck. Like you fire him, right? Because this this is ridiculous, right? It's like, but this is how our tax code works. You know, the rise and run are not. It's not all created equal, right? Okay, so this is just the same seven brackets, but it's laid out in a visual or a tax map, so you can actually see what's going on here. And this is very helpful when we're helping do tax protect projections each and every year to show how different in types of incomes coming in the door are going to affect your effective tax rate, which is what we're going to get into later as well. And I've also, I'm going to bring up the 12 and the 32 brackets right now because I've left those out at the beginning, obviously, because those are some areas where we can do a lot of good tax planning right around those because, you know, 12 to 22 is a really big jump. And then of course, up to 24 to 32 is another big jump. So we want to, um, if we can keep, you know, we don't ever want to, unless there's some crazy circumstances going on, I'm generally never going to bump anybody into a 32% bracket unless it's just unavoidable, right? Which means someone has a really good income, right? So that's that's a good problem to have. But there's a lot between those thresholds, those little rise and runs of those steps, there's some really good planning in those two areas. And that's why I highlighted those. Okay, marginal tax rates. What does that mean? Well, this concept basically just means, okay, it's going to be the, la the the tax bracket that your last dollar falls into. So a lot of times your effective rate, you might be in the 22 or 24% bracket, but your effective tax rate might actually only be like 15 or 16. And the reason for that is you only pay that amount in each bracket that you're in. So each on that stair, that rise and run of that staircase, you're only paying each bracket on what the bracket is. So let's say you're in the 22% tax bracket in the next thousand dollars, you actually bump into the 24% bracket. Only on that thousand dollars that goes into that 24% bracket, are you going to pay 24%. So a lot of times people just think, oh man, I'm in the 24% bracket. I got to pay 24% on everything. That's not how it works. Okay. So just real quick on that. Okay. And then also now we're into our three bucket system, our capital gains and qualified dividends. You know, these get preferential treatment. And why do they do that? They're doing that because they're trying to encourage investment. You know, they're trying to get people to be mindful with their money. Right. And so this is a beneficial three bucket system. And this is what it looks like. So the thresholds are totally different. And again, there's only three. Right. So they're definitely preferred to our seven bracket system. So three brackets here. I know I interchange buckets and brackets, but anyway, it's the same thing, right? I think it's pretty easy to follow. Oh, and again, too, um, all the stuff that we're gonna look at today is married filing jointly because that's still what we see for the lion's share of our clients. And yes, we definitely have lots of individuals as well um, for whatever reason, but basically just cut everything in half if you're an individual. But most of the stuff I'm gonna show you today is married filing jointly just because that's what we see the lion's share of still. Uh, and as you can see here, you know, if all you had on your uh, tax return was capital gains, you get all the way up to 89250 this year is going to be 0%, a 0% tax. So almost $90,000. That's pretty good, right? That's about the same or the equivalent of the 10 or, or the 12% bracket in the seven bucket system. So that's a big difference, right? 12% if you're ordinary income, 0% up to 90000 if you are in a um, the capital gains and qualified dividends bracket. So big difference, right? Okay. And then of course you got, it, it, it's 15% all the way up to 500, over 550,000. And then the max, it maxes out at 20. 
So, I mean, the 22% bracket in our ordinary income kicks in at just over $90,000, right? Or I'm sorry, just under that. So, so very big difference. We definitely prefer these brackets if we can. Okay. And again, here is just a tax map of that uh, three bucket or three bracket system of the capital gains just laid out so you can see the rise and run. All right. Deductions, exemptions, and credits. Now, these are going to reduce your net federal tax bill, effectively making the first several thousand dollars um, into your household tax-free, right? They all have a little bit different effect, but essentially they're going to lower your tax bill. Um, first of all, exemptions, they're Basically, we used to get these before just for being alive. You got um, a deduction or an exemption for every person in your house, but we these are gone now, right? So I'm not going to go into these big time right now because they're they're gone. The the Tax Jobs and Cuts Act that was implemented in 2018 did away with this. Now we have deductions, and as you can see here, if you are married filing jointly, your deduction this year is twenty seven thousand seven hundred, which is very big, right? That's great. Only about 10% of people are itemizing anymore because our standard deduction is so high, you know, which, which is a good thing. It makes things simple, right? But it obviously has changed some stuff for some people, certainly um, if you're charitably inclined, right? Also, um, if you are 65 or blind, you get an additional deduction of $1,500 per person. So if you're 65 plus and you're married filing jointly, you're actually going to have a deduction of over $30,000. Yeah. So that's pretty good, right? <clears throat> Okay, and then credits. Now, pound for pound or dollar for dollar credits are better than a deduction because you get an actual dollar for dollar deduction of what your tax bill was going to be, whereas a deduction is just going to reduce your taxable amount. So credits are better. They are done to incentivize behavior um, and help take care of stuff. You know, obviously during COVID, we got different credits and so on and so forth. A lot of those have been phased out now for, for the most part now. Um, but they do this to incentivize behavior. So credits are dollar for dollar better than deductions, but you know we'll take either if we can get them right. But if we had a choice, we would take a credit over that. Now, also, um, you want to, yeah, we'll, we'll just we'll leave that there. There's some stuff I'm going to come back to later. <clears throat> okay, and here is just a tax map of deductions. Right, as you can see here, Mary filing jointly over sixty five, thirty thousand dollars in deductions. So pretty high. All right. Now, taxes 201. Now, this is going to be stuff that's going to apply specifically to you, retirees or pre-retirees, right? And this is the kind of stuff that is going to have a large impact on the tax rate that you pay in retirement, right? Because remember, it's often more about where your income comes from in retirement than your actual income that's going to determine your tax rate, right? And you're going to see why here as we go through these. First of all, how do RMDs work? Well, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this because there's a chart. It's actually in your tax guide too um, of the denominator, what to divide your, your uh, nest egg. If it, you always have to take December 31st of the year before and divide it by the however old you are. There's a different, and, and again, it's in your table. And it's going to be on the next screen too. But real quick, what's more important to think about right now is it used to be 70 and a half that uh, required minimum distributions kicked in, right? And the SECURE Act 1.0 actually kicked that up to 72 which is great. And then the 2.0, which came into effect in, in January of this year, actually kicked that to 73 for everybody that was born between 1951 and 59. If you're already taking RMDs, nothing's going to change. Um, and this doesn't count inherited IRAs. We're not going to go into that, but that's different. If you're if you're taking a, uh, for your personal IRA accounts or, or pre-tax account, 401k or whatever it might be, if you were born between 1951 or 59, your uh, RMD age is going to be 73. So no one's actually going to pay a new required minimum distribution this year. If you turn 72 this year, you get to wait till next year, right? So, but if you're already paying, you have to keep paying. Nothing changed there. And then if actually, if you're born in 1960 or after, then you we're going to, we're going to not, our RMDs are not going to kick in until um, uh, 75. And that's great because between, retire the, re between our retirement years and our RMD years, are great what we call the gap years, and they're great years for tax planning because you're not bringing in, you're not typically not going to have an earned income anymore, and you don't have to take out of your IRA unless you're living off it, which is fine too. But if we if you don't have to, if you have you know three buckets of money, your pre-tax, your after-tax, and your tax-free, 
or if you have, you know, whatever you have going on, everybody's situation is a little bit different, but we call those the gap years. And, and there's, those are the best years to do tax planning um, as far as manipulating the tax brackets and making stuff work for us. I'm going to cover that a little bit. Not, I shouldn't say manipulating, but we're, we're maximizing what we can do to the benefit of lowering your lifetime tax liability. Because again, you should always pay every cent that you owe the IRS, but you never want to pay one penny. more. I don't want my clients to leave the IRS a tip, right? And they don't. All right. And then also um, a, a bonus for uh, people that are charitably inclined. Once you get to 70 and a half, they actually left the QCD age at 70 and a half. And which is great because people that are charitably inclined can donate directly as long as you take your IRA money. And this does have to be an IRA. It can't be another type of pre-tax account. It has to be in an IRA, a pre-tax IRA account. And if you have turned 70 and a half, you can actually donate directly from your custodian, whoever holds your money to your charity of choice or church or whatever it might be. And that never, ever hits your tax return. And eventually it's going to count as your RMD as well. So that's that's a great. So basically, if your tax rate's thirty percent, I'm just pulling a number out of the sky, and you say, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, donate directly to my church ten thousand dollars," you're gonna save you know three thousand dollars right off the top because it's not even gonna go on your tax return, and that all that money you remember in that IRA is pre-tax money, right? Uncle Sam's gonna get his pound of flesh one way or another. This way, he's not getting his pound of flesh, and you're still giving ten thousand dollars to charity. So QCDs are are fabulous for again, for charitably inclined. Uh, and we use them a lot. <clears throat> All right. Again, here's the table. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this, but as you can see, as you get older, the, de the denominator um, gets smaller. And so that means the amount that you're going to have to pay out gets higher, right? And since, you know, for people that, you know, since it kicks in at 73 now, it's going to be different. You're going to have to pay a higher amount at 73 than you would have at 70 and a half when they do kick on, but it still gives us more years to do uh, great tax planning to try to minimize the effect that this, the RMDs are going to have on your retirement. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Capital gains. Now, a lot of times people have owned throughout their, when they're climbing the proverbial retirement mountain, Right when they're in the accumul accumulation phase, when you're climbing up the proverbial retirement mountain, you probably have owned mutual funds at one point or another, right? And what happens with these is sometimes they can cause phantom gains, or they can trigger rebalances, or they can they can bump you up in brackets, or cause certain credits or deductions to get phased out, and you don't even know it, right? And I'm going to explain. Um, they can create, like as I said, unexpected income tax or uh, phantom phantom taxes, right? And I'm going to explain how that happened. The best way to do that is with an example. So let's say it's 1997. We're going to flash back a little bit here. And everybody's heard of Apple, right? Everybody's probably got, well, not all of you, but I'm sure a, a large percentage of you have a an iPhone, right? I do. I love Apple. It's very intuitive. But let's say it's 1997. And Apple has somehow got itself three months from being in bankruptcy. They call Steve Jobs. They're like, hey, come back, Steve. You know, we're going to we, we need you to try to turn this around. Well, this mutual fund manager says, hey, you know what? Steve Jobs is coming back. He's going to turn this thing around. It's going to be worth two, three trillion dollars one day, which is amazing that that's what it's worth right now. Right. So let's say this guy buys it or gal. This fund manager buys Apple at a dollar in their mutual fund. And fast forward to maybe a year ago and you say, hey, you know what? Um, or your advisor, whoever you have, or whatever, just you end up in this mutual fund that bought this Apple stock all those years ago. And obviously, let's, I don't know what it is split adjusted, but I think it's around 170 today. So let's say it's gone from a dollar to 170, huge returns, right? So you buy this mutual fund, you, you did, you only owned it this past year <clears throat> or two years. It, you know, it doesn't really matter exactly when, but just recently. So you missed the lion's share of those gains, right? And let's say this, this fund manager says, you know what? Apple's had a great run. I still love Apple, but I've found some better ideas. So I'm going to sell this position and I'm going to buy something else. I'm going to buy ABC stock, which we're going to talk about more, which it's it's fictitious anyway. But just they're, they're, they're shifting gears. They're selling out of Apple. Well, now what happens is you still own that. You, you missed the lion's share of the gains, but they sell that fund and then you still have to pay tax on that. Is that fair? No, it's not fair, but that's how our tax code's set up, right? It's kind of crazy. 
So again, this causes phantom gains or it causes income to pop up on your tax return, only you're not using it to live on. It's just kind of messing with your brackets and your, your credits and deductions, right? But this is the kind of stuff that you have to be aware of if you want to be as tax efficient as possible. And I know a lot of people aren't paying attention to this because I see it when people come in and they've bumped over brackets or hit thresholds and um, or their Medicare, you know, which we're going to cover a little bit too. They're because it's based, your Medicare premiums are based on your income, right? Parts B and D. So if you bump over that by $1, that's going to cause you to pay an extra few thousand dollars a year in Medicare. So you want to pay attention to this stuff. Obviously, you don't have to worry about that till you're 65, right? But again, every year, even if you're younger than that, it's going to text your, this is going to affect your tax return. And it's okay if it happens as long as you know it's going to happen. Being aware of it is a big part of it, right? That's what this presentation is also about. Obviously, you know, it's a way for us to introduce ourselves and say, hey, look, we're competent and we're good and we have integrity because we have to have all that for you guys to trust us, right? But it's also a chance for us to say, hey, this is what you need to be aware of because, you know, you don't do this every day. Why would you know this? Why would you even think about this stuff, right? I'm sure that you're getting closer, you're paying attention, you obviously showed up. So you are trying to educate yourself, which is perfect because you don't want to be a procrastinator and get hit with the tax bomb, which I'm going to cover in a little bit. All right. So again, watch out for phantom gains from mutual funds. All right. Now, our lovely provisional income formula. Now, um, again, over time, our, our government or our IRS or Congress wants to get, they always want to get as much revenue as they can from us, right? And they do this a lot of times by changing certain things. Before 1984, our uh, Social Security wasn't even taxed. But this is how it is taxed now. They use what is called here on the screen, provisional income formula. And so basically they take 50% of your Social Security and then they add in ordinary income, capital gains, dividends, non-taxable interest. So even if you hold municipalities because you're trying to avoid tax, they're still going to calculate that in this provisional income. So that's nice of them, right? Kidding, it's not nice. But basically half your Social Security, all other forms of income, and that's going to be your provisional income, right? And now it can have some really weird impact for people in the middle class or upper, upper middle and upper middle class, right? There might be some ways around to getting where you might not hit this. Sometimes you're going to hit it and it doesn't matter because your income's too high. Again, good problem to have, but sometimes there's a lot of things we can do, especially in those gap years to mitigate it. And once you have, they have the provisional income calculated, then they lay these thresholds on top of it to say, this is how much we're going to tax, tax your social security. There's a 50% threshold and there's an 85% threshold. So everybody's going to get 15% of their social security tax free, right? Um, but there's going to be these thresholds. And again, they're different for individual than they are married finally jointly. Not humongously. It's not a half thing like before, but they are different. So you get the income and then you lay these thresholds on top. And the best way, again, to demonstrate how this works is by example. And, and guys, too, and gals, just so you know, a lot of these samples that I, all these samples, actually in one form or another, have come from actual situations that we've had. I've, I've rounded off the numbers. I've changed them a little bit because the tax rates or codes have changed. But these are actual scenarios that we've dealt with at my firm. All right. So here, this is the example. So in this scenario, um, this, this couple, or you can call it two couples or one couple just doing things differently, they want to get to $60,000 in income. Right. So if we do the provisional income formula, we take uh, they need twenty thousand dollars in the first scenario of Social Security. Then they need forty thousand dollars from their IRA to get to sixty thousand dollars. Now, that is going to cause fifty thousand dollars of provisional income. Why? Because you're going to take half of the Social Security, which is ten thousand dollars plus forty thousand dollars of your IRA money. And that's going to cause fifty thousand dollars of provisional income. And that's going to cause. 55% of your social security to be taxed or $11,100, right? Now in the second scenario, they actually have more coming from social security. Maybe it's the same couple, but they were able to push out a few years when they actually started claiming their social security and it was a higher rate, right? And this is what we do if we, this is what we try to do if we can't, because it's going to, it's going to lower your lifetime tax liability. And this is why. So now it's a few years later, they're getting $40,000 of social security. And then they're taking only taking 20 thousand dollars from their IRA to get to their sixty thousand dollars that they're trying to get to, right? And now that's going to cause only forty thousand dollars of provisional income. So you take 40 divided by two, 20 plus the 20 from the IRA, and that's going to add up to 40, right? So now you lay the thresholds on top of that, and it's only going to cause four thousand dollars of your social security to be taxed or 10%. So big difference, right? 
And that's a funky thing that our provisional income formula can do. I actually just had this with a couple that I'm, that I'm um, just introduced themselves to me last week. They found us at a, a prior workshop and he came in and we talked and he, he couldn't figure out, well, you know, they're great. They're set for retirement, but he's like, Hey, our tax rate doubled from last year. What happened? And we laid down, I laid down in our, our, uh, our holistic plan planning software tool, which is down in the weeds. It, it gives us line by line breakdown. And I said, well, you have more income here, 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 and here. And that caused almost twice as much of your social security to become taxable. And that's why you're basically, you're, you, you got, you know, your income was twice as much cause your, your income to be twice as much. Your taxes, you know, went up quite a bit. Again, we can lay that out for people, obviously in hindsight, but also projecting forward. So we can say, how do we mitigate that? You know, how do we sand off the rough edges of our lifetime tax liability? And so anyway, that just happened to a couple that I've been talking with. All right. Because remember again, a lot of times in retirement, it's more about where your income is going to come from that's going to determine your tax rate rather than your actual income itself, right? All right. Now, everybody always is having these conversations with their advisor or, you know, trying to find stuff up on, find their stuff on their own about, you know, hey, I have enough money to live on. That's not the problem. But how do I lay the tax code on top of our retirement income situation to make sure that we're not getting hosed in taxes, right? That's what we're here for. So if you're not having that conversation, you need to be. <clears throat> and again, you, it's better off to coordinate all this stuff together, right? Okay. Now, if you have not paid attention to anything at all that I have talked about today, pay attention to this because this uh, this conversation of the next couple minutes is going to talk is going to show you what I mean by retirement tax bond. So, if you are one of those people that has the problem that we discussed at the beginning about having a large pre-tax account, you know, great job, good job saving. And you, you should have been doing that because that's what everybody was telling you to do. Put your money in this. We'll match it. Your company, you know, your advisor, whoever. You're, you're, you're climbing up the accumulation phase, right? But now, a lot of times what will happen, and, and this I had this story right now that I have, this, I've had quite a few stories with this because what happens is, if you if people end up paying a higher tax rate than they should have because they haven't done proper tax planning when they have to start taking their RMDs, that's irritating, right? But to double down or make it twice as bad for a lot of people is they end up also, they don't realize that, you know, when you reach retirement, your Medicare premiums, your part, part A you're going to get for free. Everybody knows that. But parts B and D you have to pay. And that is determined by your income, right? Your, your adjusted gross income. Is going to affect the premium amount that you're going to pay on those parts B and D. And so what happens is a lot of times people, let's say a hypothetical couple. Well, actually, I, every every winter I try to go on a, a, a vacation to somewhere nice with, and usually my cousin, his wife goes. And he was telling me this year um, that his father-in-law, who has an advisor old school, doesn't do any tax planning, um, but they're very tight. But he's for years has been trying to get him to talk to me or somebody like me. So I also people, even if you don't. You know, if you don't want to talk to me, you need to talk to us, but I'm going to give you a 30 minute visit for free. So you might as well start with that. Right. But you need to be thinking about this stuff. And this is why. So his father, in -law, they've done everything, right. you know, him and his wife, pensions, they saved up while they lived very prudent, very frugal lives. Um, but they've been saving up, done a great job. And now next year, he's going to be 73. And that he said he's going to have to start taking his RMDs. And that is going to kick him up into the 32% tax bracket, right? When he has to start taking that. And they've been retired for, I can't remember, it was seven, eight, 10 years, whatever amount it is, doesn't matter. They've been retired for years, right? Perfect. Super happy for them. But they have not been doing any tax planning in this time. They have not been using their gap years to maximize or lower or limit their lifetime tax liability. So now he's going to have to start taking RMD. So he was super happy for the last five, six, whatever amount of years it's been, 10 years of saying, hey, you know, we we were paying this much in tax right before we retired. And now for the last so many years, we've been only paying it on our social security or whatever they're paying, you know, very minimal and their pensions because they do both have pensions again. Now they're going to get kicked up into this 32% bracket. So not only are they going to be paying a higher tax rate than they should be because they, they didn't do top proper tax planning. But every single year, they're going to be paying almost an extra $12,000 in their Medicare Parts B and D. 
So again, and this is the part that really, when I bring this up and, and people realize that whoever they've been working with or if they've been doing it on their own and they haven't paid attention to this, this really, really irritates people. And it should, right? Because not only are they going to pay a higher tax rate than they needed to, 32%, now they're going to pay just in Medicare premiums alone an extra $12,000 a year, almost. So ouch, right? And they're like, God, why didn't our guy show us this or our gal? You know, we've been working with them for 20 years or 30 years. Well, you know, they're... You know, nothing against them. A lot of times if, if they're working for, you know, maybe a Wall Street firm or a bank or an insurance company or whatever, or just an older, you know, uh, firm that doesn't do tax planning. That's what they're taught. There are a lot of times they're account managers, right? So maybe they're managing four or 500 accounts, you know, as opposed to basically, you know, I would max out probably on my own, you know, 50, 100 clients to do comprehensive planning the way we do it. Maggie, obviously that's going to... Uh, we can go a little further than that. And if we get to that point, we want to grow perfect, but it's just a whole different mindset. It's a whole different process that we do at my firm. So again, you want to make sure that you are taking advantage and planning, even though maybe you can go a few years before your RMDs kick in. That's why you're, when I say retirement tax bomb, that is, this is part of it, right? These excess premiums that you're going to have to pay on your part B and D because your AGI is too high. And Unfortunately, it could a lot of it could have been mitigated, you know, and maybe you would have a few years where you'd have to be paying these higher premiums, doing some Roth conversions or whatnot. But it's certainly now it's going to probably last the, the rest of their life, assuming the markets don't go down. And we don't have Armageddon because and if we do, there's nothing we can do about that anyway. But if you're doing proper planning and life continues on and over time, the markets continue to grow. A lot of that could have been mitigated, you know, and I'm going to I'm going to show you a little bit more on that. But. Again, I hope you paid attention to that part because I hear all the time that people say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm good. I'm kind of paying a super low tax rate. Yeah, but do you know what you're sitting on? Do you know what's going to happen in a few years? Boom. And then all of a sudden, you're getting kicked up in those upper brackets and you're paying a ton. Okay. So I hope you remember that. And again, it's all about laying the tax code on the next 20, 30, 40 years of your retirement and making sure that you are limiting your lifetime tax liability because you don't want Uncle Sam to get too much of what or you don't want him to get any penny more than he needs or, you know, legally needs. Right. All right. <clears throat> All right. Effective tax rate. So, again, back to the intuitive part. Right. A lot of times people think, hey, I'm in the 22 percent bracket. That's what they pay. That is not what happens. Certainly in retirement, when you have different incomes coming in different ways and it causes funky things to happen. And another reason this happens, because a lot of times, you know, like I said, government always wants to get tax revenue. Right. But the method that they do, a lot of times they don't change the brackets or the rates for all, because that's headline news. Right. That's going to be in a headline unless they're cutting it. And then, of course, they want everybody. To, hey, we're cutting this, you know, and oh, awesome. Nobody wants to pay more tax than they need to. Right. They might think someone else needs to pay more tax, but not them. Right. But again, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll introduce some kind of phase out or deduction or exemption. Um, and it's not going to affect everybody the same way. It's going to affect different income classes, different thresholds um, at, at different times. And they do that because they don't want you to know. They want to make it confusing on purpose, you know, and I'm going to cover that in a little bit with a different conversation. But they're going to introduce phase in, phase out of different exemptions, deductions, credits, um, just like I said before, like before 1984, Social Security wasn't even taxed. Right. So they do this because they want your revenue but they don't want you to know that you're paying it all the time. And, and I've got a really good example of something that happened in the Secure Act 1.0 of 2020 that really changed a lot of how legacy planning is thought about or done. And, 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 and again, I'm going to go into that, but it, it really, it really kind of irked me because it's basically a phantom or a shadow tax on the um, middle income and, and middle upper middle incomes of this country. <clears throat> All right. And also basically, you know, effective tax rate is how much of your last uh, dollar did you actually have to give to Uncle Sam? Right. OK. All right. And then right here, um, again, just the tax map. If you if you're in the 22 percent bracket, you think, hey, why am I not paying 22 percent? Or for the example that we're going to cover in a bit here. Hey, I'm in the 12 percent bracket. Why am I paying more than 12 percent? All right. Again, uh, the best way to illustrate this is a real life case study. Again, the numbers have been changed on this because the, the rates just changed again this year, the thresholds of our tax code, because again, our, our tax code is written in pencil, right? It's it changed all the time. But we have John and Jane Doe or whatever, and they're married finally jointly and they're over 65. So you get a, 
plus $30,000 deduction. So that's good, right? They've got $60,000 combined Social Security. They've got $15,000 of long-term capital gains so far. And they've got $45,000 of their required minimum distributions coming in the door, right? So let's see how this is going to affect. This is the tax map of their situation. And again, intuitively, you would think the dark gray is what they're going to pay, right? They're come, they got money coming in the, the door. They've got their you know, 0% up to 30,000, then the 12 or 10% and then 12%. But the light gray that's laid on top of that dark gray on that chart there is what they actually end up paying. And as you can see, like they're basically their social security is getting taxed right away. And that's what's causing their, you know, 80 or uh, uh, yeah, 85% of their social security is getting taxed almost immediately. And so they're in the 18 effective tax rate is 18.5 right away. And then they're going to get kicked up again to 22.2 once they hit the 12% bracket. And then I'm sure everyone noticed the 49.95% effective marginal tax rate, right? Because how can you miss that? Like, oh, people see that, like, oh my God, what happened there? Or if they're if we're sitting and looking at personal uh, tax math for people and they see that, they're like, uh, how do we do that? And sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. But a lot of times there is too, you know, there's, there's ways to mitigate this. But again, what the heck happened, right? Because again, like the rise and um, run of our system, certainly our effective rates are not, it's not all created equal, right? All right. So here's what happened. <clears throat> so they had their income and then they decided for whatever reason, hey, we need an extra thousand dollars. We want to buy all the grandkids a new bike or we want to take them to Six Flags or whatever it might be. So, but they needed an extra thousand dollars, right? And so what intuitively what would happen you bring in that thousand dollars, and it causes a hundred, and they're in the twelve percent tax bracket. So one hundred twenty dollars they have to pay in tax, right? But what actually happened is that triggered three other taxes. The first was the intuitive twelve percent bracket, and that is going to cause eight hundred and fifty dollars of their Social Security. Because remember, you get fifteen percent tax free, right? But eight hundred and fifty dollars of their Social Security to become taxable. And so that's $102. And now these two together are actually going to drag because you hit the threshold of up to from zero to 15% on their long-term capital gains now, the income threshold. So now that dragged more of their income of their long-term capital gains to be taxed at 15%. So even though it's preferred, that's a lot bigger chunk that has to be taxed now because now 1850 of that has to be taxed at 15%. That's $277.50. So if you add all that together, that's almost $500, $499.50 they got taxed. So of that extra $1,000 that they needed, almost half of it is going to go to tax. So what we might do is say, hey, look, we're, we have this going on. Let's wait till next year if they can. You know, let's pull it from here. That's not going to be taxed. Do this, so on and so forth. But again, knowing about it is, is having the knowledge of what's going on is going to make a huge difference, right? Because we want to keep as much of that as we can. Obviously, thousand dollars, you know, paying half of that taxes, the, the percentage is 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 very irritating. You know, five hundred dollars for people that are bringing in that much, not huge, but again, this is the type of stuff that all these little things add up, right? And a lot of them, most of them, a lot bigger than this. You know, so it could be death by a thousand cuts, but a lot of times the amount or the amplitude can really add up. Certainly over 10, 20, 30 year retirement. And we're going to cover a little bit more of that <clears throat> as well. Okay, now on to some stuff that can have an immediate impact. So again, a lot of times in retirement, it's not about where your income comes, or it's more about where your income comes from rather than your actual income that's going to determine your tax rate or on that previous screen, your effective marginal tax rate. So again, today we started with the problem is a lot of times people have a lion's share of their nest egg or maybe not even lion's share, but just a big chunk in a pre-tax account, right? So how do I get Uncle Sam out of my pre-tax accounts and how do I pay him off, get him out of that partnership as efficiently and cheaply as possible, right? Because we want to create a tax efficient retirement. So we're going to go into um, a few, uh, three concepts here at the end of today's workshop and three types of money. And then we're going to discuss to defer or not to defer. And then we're going to discuss what the widow's or widower's tax is. All right. Now, first, we have three types of money, right? People don't think about this, but 
three types of money, and they're all going to be taxed differently or not taxed. If it's a Roth tax-free, which, of course, like I said, we love Roths at my firm. Try to get as much as we can into them. But everything has different tax consequences. And where we hold our actual investments makes a big difference, too. And that's called asset location. So I know you've all heard the phrase at one point in your life, location, location, location. Well, it also applies to your nest egg, your investments, because most of us have these three accounts, or even if you have one or two types, what we're going to try to do with them is going to be location, location, location. And um, Vanguard estimates um, asset location um, provides a value of 0.6% a year. So that alone is, is a lot of value if you're doing it properly, right? And also, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but withdrawing from the proper amount at the proper time, the proper account at the proper time makes a huge difference too over your lifetime in retirement as you're coming down the proverbial um, retirement mountain, right? Turning your nest egg into an income stream. All right. So the best way to illustrate this, of course, is with ABC stock. So we're going to buy ABC stock. And of course, why do we buy ABC stock? Well, we thought it was going to go up in value right? So we buy ABC stock or your advisor had you do it or whatever it is, right? <clears throat> but now, again, you probably didn't even know you were making these decisions in the past, but you have to decide where you're going to buy that. Where are you going to hold that ABC stock? Are you going to put it in your pre-tax account, which is your 401k or your IRA? Are you going to do that in your after-tax account, um, which would be usually an individual or a joint brokerage account? Or are you going to do that in your tax-free or your Roth account? Because they're all going to have different implications, right? <clears throat> Okay, so let's say we bought ABC stock in our pre-tax account. How's that going to be taxed if you're in a pre-tax bucket? Well, let's say it goes from 10 to 100, right? Now it's going to come out when you take it out to you need it at this point to live on in retirement for income or whatever, right? When it comes out, it's going to be taxed at the seven bucket system, right? regular income tax. So that's the highest tax tax rates in our current code right now, right? So so we need to think about that. And then our after-tax accounts, let's say it goes from 10 to 100 there, and we've held it over a year. Well, that's going to be taxed at our preferred three bucket or three brackets, which are zero, um, 15, and 20. So that's definitely preferred, right, to our seven bucket system. And then, of course, the tax-free again, which I said, you know, obviously our, our favorite accounts is our, our Roth accounts. They're going to be tax-free because if you if you've the money you put into it can always come, come out tax-free because you've already pay tax, but the, for the earnings to be tax free, you actually have to have that account open for five years. So something to think about a lot of times it's not an issue because people need money out of it. They can just take their, the part they've already paid tax on <clears throat> out to do whatever they need to do with the money. So now <clears throat> on to that's how, that's how money coming out of those accounts is going to be taxed. Now let's say something else happens now. Let's say, unfortunately, ABC stock goes down in value. Has anybody ever had that happen? Investment lose money? I'm the only one. I'm kidding. If any of you have been invested over the long term, of course, you've had some investments that have lost money, right? That's part of the game. Nothing can go straight up or the markets would not even be markets. They would just be, I don't even know what you'd call it, but nothing can go straight up. But over time, our, our, our stock market and our economy has done very well uh, for whatever reason, you know, the, the, the silent hand or whatever they call it. <clears throat> but anyway, um, so let's say ABC stocks go, goes down in value. So we're going to lose money no matter what. So that's a bummer. But from a tax perspective, in this middle bucket, in this after-tax bucket, there's actually some things that we can do um, called tax loss harvesting that can mitigate or lower our lifetime tax liability. Again, it's another thing to think about, but from a tax perspective, uh, and the other ones, the retirement accounts, whether it's pre-tax, that's going to be taxed at income rates. So it doesn't matter what's going on internally there or the Roth account is going to come out as um, tax free. So, again, that's our, our favorite, most beneficial account. Right. But in this middle account and I actually I used this last year because I had sold some stuff last January at, at a gain. So I was sitting on some gains and then, you know, um, I had some stuff that had gone down last year. And so come December. And I was going to be in a tax bracket I did not want to be in. And I could sell that other stuff to offset the gains I had earlier in the year. So I sold that stuff in December. And that's called tax loss harvesting. because And that dropped me down. My tax rate was went from one rate to another because of tax loss harvesting. And again, it, it, I don't try, like a lot of you know firms online or like robo firms, or 
that try to sell tax loss harvesting as this big thing. And it is like you can it can definitely mitigate your lifetime tax liability or keep you in a lower bracket, but you still lost money. So maybe it's more of a, you know, maybe a, a band aid when you need a tourniquet or something like that. Right. But again, it's part of something that we can do to shave off the rough edges of your lifetime tax liability. And again, the other two accounts, they are retirement accounts that are either going to be tax free or come out to regular income if it's a pre-tax account, um, the seven bracket system. Right. All right. Now, another question that comes up all the time is, OK, say, Tim, sometimes people are are not interested in legacy planning, but most of the time they are. Right. I want to leave you know, what I built up in my life. I want to live a great retirement, but also I want to have some left at the end to hopefully pass on to my legacy, my children, you know, so on and so forth. Make it a little easier for them to breathe. Right. <clears throat> so. And so what's going to happen? when, God forbid, I pass, right? What are the taxes going to look like? Well, if it's in that pre-tax account, it's going to come out. It's going to turn into an, from an IRA into an inherited IRA. And it's going to come out not at your retirement tax rate, but it's going to come out at their tax rate, whatever their current tax rate is. And again, this is the part that I was talking about earlier when I say, unfortunately, they like to do phantom things or mess with the tax code in a way that it's not going to be um, obvious that you're you're paying these phantom taxes or you're getting kind of hosed in a tax. What they did was they did the, the Secure Act 1.0 in 2020 did away with the stretch IRA, which used to allow for you to be able to stretch out an inherited IRA over your own lifetime. So it wouldn't be a huge amount that you have to take out every year, certainly while you were in your 50s or 60s, statistically when most you know parents are going to die in their 80s and 90s and, and you're going to inherit that money, you could stretch it out over your lifetime. So it wasn't going to cause most of the time, a huge increase in your income of that year, right? Because it was a smaller amount. Now they said, you got to pull that out within 10 years. Why do they do that? Again, they're making you take that 10 out over a 10-year period when it's probably going to sit right on top of your peak earning years in your 50s and 60s, right before you retire. So again, it's kind of a phantom tax on the middle and upper middle income class. So that's, you know, that's kind of, I don't know, I, I was not happy with it. And if you haven't done any estate planning since that, since 2020, you need to talk with your estate planning attorney or at least think about what you have going on because you're probably going to need to make some adjustments, right? So again, the SECURE Act uh, 1.0 greatly changed how inherited assets in an IRA are effective. Um, and now onto the middle bucket. Um, real quick on the Roth too, I'm, I'm just going to skip over that and go back to the... Uh, um, step up in basis in the in the taxable bucket. But the Roth accounts are also required to take out the money within that 10-year period because they're technically an IRA as well, Roth IRA. But since it's already tax-free money, it doesn't have near the impact, right? But they still have to take the money out within 10 years. It's just, it's not going to have that tax bomb effect of leaving that money to your legacy because it's already been taxed, right? So that's a whole different scenario. And, um, but now in this after-tax bucket, um, there's this thing called step up and basis. And it's actually pretty cool. So what happens is, let's say in this bucket, you have ABC stock, right? And you bought it at $10 and then it goes to $100 and you don't sell it, you pass away, right? So you pass away, it goes to your heirs. And it's just like they bought it at whatever the, the price was you, you bought or uh, whatever it was the day you died. So let's say it's at $100 the day you die. The next day they could sell it hypothetically, and they would pay at $100 and they would pay, they would pay no income tax at all. So not even the preferred bucket system of um, 0, 15, and 20. It's just like they bought it at $100. That's called step up and basis. So again, um, that's pretty cool. Now, no one likes to think about their own mortality, right? But if we know that someone, you know, maybe has a year or two or three to live, there's some things we can do a lot of times to maybe get the stepped up and basis um, with married couples, so anyway, like I said, I know nobody likes to think about the mortality, but there is some stuff that we can do sometimes with that. <clears throat> All right. Now, now we're on to what I, what I started this conversation out as um, asset location. Where do we want to hold ABC stock? It depends on the type of investment it is. You know, again, let's say, you know, you're a do-it-yourself or you've been working with, working with an advisor that does not lay the tax code on top of your retirement income situation. Now, they've just been helping with accumulation. They don't look at the tax code, right? Again, you want to diversify from an investment. 
um, an investment risk standpoint, but now you want to lay the tax code on top and you want to diversify or de-risk from a tax perspective. Right? Certainly in retirement, if you certainly in those gap years, when you have those are prime years that you can do a lot of good tax planning, or we could do that too. Obviously, that's what we do every day, right? Now, <clears throat> what happens? Let's say again, we're going to take ABC stock and we're going to say it goes from 10 to 100. Well, would we want to hold that in our pre-tax account, our IRA or our 401k? No, you know, if you're going to have a de-risk portfolio, you you know, when that comes out, if it comes out at 100, you, you know, it's gone from 10 to 100, you're going to pay, you're going to pay the seven bucket system on that whole amount, right? Which is the highest rates in our code. So we don't want that. If we're going to have something go from 10 to 100, the way our current tax code is, I would argue that it should be in our Roth account, right? Because if it goes from 10 to 100, it's going to come out tax free, right? So that's kind of a no brainer, but no one thinks about this. And again, this is the stuff that um, Vanguard values at 0.6% a year if it's done properly over time. You know, so if you have whatever amount of money, 0.6% a year adds up a lot over 10, 20, 30 years doing this stuff properly. And even if you're going to have something go from 10 to 100, you would rather hold it in that middle bucket, right? The after tax bucket, because as long as it's held for more than a year, then it's going to be taxed at those preferred rates of 0, 10, or, or I'm sorry, um, 0, 15, or 20, right? The preferential buckets as opposed to the seven bucket system. So we want to put the growth, most growth oriented stuff in a Roth account. And then we want to hold, you know, the middle risk stuff or, you know, once we fill up the Roth with the growth, then we want to put it in the, the long term capital gains bucket or the after tax bucket, as long as we hold it over a year. And then we want to put our more conservative, our steady eddy stuff, you know, uh, treasuries, bonds, that kind of thing. We want to put those in a pre-tax account. Right. Because they're not going to they're not going to grow as much, but they're going to. And also, a lot of times those things are paying interest every single year. Right. And you don't want that in your your middle bucket, your taxable account where you got to pay tax on it every year. And it's you know kind of messing with your uh, unless you have to, you know, if you don't have all these accounts. But you, you don't want that in your middle bucket if it's because sometimes it's going to do the same thing. It's showing up on your tax return as interest, interest and dividends are. But they're not helping you. You know, you're not living off it. It's just messing with your deductions and exemptions and so on and so forth. So you want to put that stuff that's bearing interest every year in your pre-tax account because you're going to have to pay tax on that anyway when it comes out, right? So basically it's, it's saving you from being taxed twice, right? From a certain point of view. But again, if you're going to have something go from 10 to 100, you want it to be in the Roth, right? The, the tax-free account. So that is called asset location. Again, remember location, location, location. And that alone adds a lot of value doing that properly over time. <clears throat> All right. Now, the second concept, to defer or not to defer. A lot of times people come in, they say, well, Tim, you know, I'm that person you're talking about. I have a lion's share of my nest egg in a pre-tax account. You know, um, it's in a 401k or now it's an IRA because you've moved out of there or whatever. <clears throat> and why wouldn't you? Again, that's what my industry told you to do, right? Or your employer or whoever. But at this point, the question is, you know, how do I get my, how do I get that out of my IRA or how do I start to take advantage of some of these things? Or should I be doing these things called Roth conversions? Well, now I'm going to frame how you should think about the Roth conversion conversation. And real quick, I want to say too, a lot of times people get confused. A Roth contribution is totally different than a Roth conversion. A contribution does have income thresholds. Um, people say that I can't contribute to a Roth. I make too much money. A contribution, totally different than a conversion. Technically, Whatever amount you have in a pre-tax account, you can convert at any time. So if you had a million dollars in your pre-tax account in 401k, you can convert that to a Roth all at once, but you're going to pay tax on it. So you don't want to do that. You want to take full advantage of your gap years between retirement and RMD age, and you want to convert in those years. So maybe five, six, 10 years um, to make sure that you're bumping up to certain thresholds, but you're not going into the 32% bracket or whatever, 24% bracket, maybe even or 22 if you don't need to, right? So that's what I mean by you know making sure that you're following certain thresholds. And again, if you're a do-it-yourself for a lot of times, you don't even like, like, even if you have all this knowledge that I'm talking about today, you know everything about it without having the proper tools to do a lot of the stuff. And I have a couple different softwares that I use that are high level and then down in the weeds that are without them, I wouldn't be near as effective or efficient as I am, you know, because what are there like seven, six, seven different types of AGIs that are affected by different thresholds and deductions. I mean, you're, you know, each one has a different actual formula. 
And, and without the certain tools that I was like, you know, if we, you call a plumber in, even if you know what the plumber's going to do, if you don't have the tools, it doesn't matter, you know, or you're going to, it's going to take you, you know, the rest of your life to do something that he could do in an hour. You know, that's the analogy that I like to use. But and again, so to, to defer or not to defer. All right, here's how you should think about this. Now, on the left-hand side, we're going to say the money is staying in pre-tax account, $100,000. We're going to say our tax rate is 25% just to make it easy, right? So we're going to say on the right-hand side, we've converted that to a Roth. Now we have $75,000, right? We pay $25,000 in taxes. Now, let's say we fast forward 10 years. Let's say both of them double, right? Um, you go from one hundred dollars to two hundred thousand dollars in the pre-tax account, the IRA. You go from seventy five dollars to one fifty dollars in the Roth. But you've already paid taxes on the Roth. You haven't paid them on the, the IRA yet, right? So now you pay 25%. We're saying it's the rates, everything stayed the same. So now you pay 25% on that. Now you're at 150. So you got it's a wash, right? You got 150 of both. Only it's not really a wash unless you convert that IRA money as well, because you have the money in the Roth that can still grow tax-free going forward. And if you basically take that Roth money and you just um, take it out to live on, you're going to pay the full board tax on it too, but it's also not in the Roth anymore. But if you're using it to live on it, but anyway, let's, let's say it's a wash, right? So here's, here's how you should think about that. Oops. Um, so let's say right now, back to the beginning, Right now, we are literally having what we're saying is a tax sale in our industry. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. Do you think our tax rates are going to go higher or lower or stay the same in the future? Most of the time, I would say 99% of the time, actually every time, because I haven't had anybody say they're going to go lower from here. Um, every time I ask that question, people say probably stay the same or higher. And right now, they're set to automatically go higher at the beginning of 2026, right? The, the TCJA is going to sunset. And, and our rates are going to go back higher. You know, 24 is going to 28 automatically, that bracket. Everything is going up 3 to 5% and all the brackets automatically. And I'm not going to try to predict what Congress is going to do because, you know, we don't want to get into that. But right now, they are automatically set to sunset at the end of uh, 2025. So we still have a few years left to do some great tax planning at these automatically lower rates where are going to save you, you know, between 3 and 5% automatically, you know, just doing stuff right now. Okay? So... If you are like the, we started with today, you have the problem of pre-tax money and you think that our rates are going higher. Well, basically you are, your investment situation, your tax accounts are not aligned with what you believe, right? Because you want to be taking this opportunity to get as much money as you can out of those, get Uncle Sam out of that partnership at these lower rates right now, right? So you want to get him out of that partnership at the lower rates before they sunset and go higher. Okay. So that's how you should think about that. Basically, the analogy is, let's say you go to the boat and you think it's going to be, you're at the roulette table, you think it's going to be black, but you're betting on red. So, and, and there's no payout. There's no, you know, 100 to 1 payout or 99 to 1 payout or whatever it might be. You're just going to pay more in taxes. So again, I know you haven't thought about this, but make sure your investment accounts and your investment retirement situation is aligned with what you think tax-wise. Okay. So that's how you need to frame that. So obviously, you know, we are doing as many conversions as we can up to certain thresholds right now. It's always different for everybody because everybody's situation is different. Assets are different. Income's different. But we are doing as many conversions as we can right now. And, and we will even after that sunset because it's still better than sitting on the retirement tax bond because that's never going to go away, right? Unless they do away with RMDs. But they're not going to do that because we know eventually Uncle Sam wants his share, right? It's a pre-tax account. We want our share when you pay that. As a matter of fact, we're going to keep raising the level of R&B you have to pay as you get older. <clears throat> okay. So if you have not been paying attention to that, you need to start because it's going to have a big effect on the amount, your, your lifetime tax liability and what you're likely to pay every single year. All right. Now, real quick, this is actually from our, our high level tax planning software. And what this shows is a couple that I've been working with for a few years now, but when they came to me, they said, hey, you know, we've been working with a guy, we, you know, he's a great dude. He's done a decent investment job for us. Um, kept us up with the rising cost of retirement, which is the goal at this point, right? As you get in retirement, you want to be, you want to keep up the rising cost of retirement, but you don't want to take any huge risks, right? Because they're living this, living off this money. When they came to me, um, he was retired, had a pension, um, and he was sitting on a good nest egg, 1.6 million in a uh, IRA, 
right? <clears throat> so we, I laid out and said, this is what we're going to be able to save you. We start doing Roth conversions for you. And at the time, this is actually a little lower because we've actually converted about $400,000, four $500,000 of his IRA to a Roth already. So I think when we initially ran this for that couple, it was going to be about one, oh, maybe $1.5 million in total lifetime savings from going from um, mid 60s to age 90. I, I usually run projections to age 90 for the most part. But as you can see there, what happens is rather than their the, the, the light blue goes all the way up. That, that high line on the right shows if their R&Ds have been allowed to grow in their pre-tax account, how much their tax they were going to be paying when they, they started taking R&Ds. Well, the green, and then that it drops off there, that little cliff is doing Roth conversions. So they're paying a little bit higher than they would have then, but then it drops down. So not only has this mitigated their, their higher tax rate that they were going to pay in retirement, but it also mitigates the higher Medicare thresholds that they would have had to pay each and every year. So that additional $12,000 every year for the rest of their life in Medicare, that's mitigated automatically because as you can see, the threshold dropped way down because everything's in Roth and it's already you already pay tax on it. But maybe it bumped up their Medicare for a few years doing some large Roth conversions on top of the pension. But overall, almost a million dollars saved. And again, when we started, it was about 1.5. And this tax savings here, this 967 thousand dollars 342 does not take into account asset location which again we already talked about 0.6 percent a year so that's another couple hundred thousand dollars in tax savings over the next 25 years of their life to consider about laying the tax code on top of your retirement income situation and it does not take into account what we're going to talk about next which is the widow's tax or widower's tax now what the heck does that mean so basically Long story short on this one, um, right now, if you're married, finally, jointly, and even if you're not, even if you're an individual, I'm sure you you, have, you know people in your family or friends that say, hey, you know, <clears throat> you guys need to take advantage of your married, finally, jointly while you can. Because God forbid one of you passes, your tax rates get cut in half, and that just for even that prior couple, the almost million dollars we're going to save them, that's going to get cut in half, right? So take advantage while you can of married, finally, jointly tax brackets. So as we can see here, this is what's happened here. We've had uh, income's not the problem for these people. They've got plenty of income, but their tax rate with both of them alive, they've got Social Security, pension, and they're taking out a certain amount to get to $96,000 every year in income, right? Well, their tax rate when they're married finally jointly was 7.9%. But then, God forbid, one of them passes. The one that remains gets the higher Social Security. They only are getting $1,500 from the pension because survivor pension. So they have to take a little bit more from their IRA, which of course causes their, their how their tax rate is determined because it's more about where it comes from rather than the actual income. As you can see here, tax brackets get cut in half. So now instead of paying $7,000, they're paying almost 13. And that is a 75% increase in the tax amount that they're paying. And a lot of times people say, hey, you know, once one of us dies off, we're only gonna need 75%. That's what they say <clears throat> in my industry. I've never seen that. People keep taking 100% of what they were taking before. Maybe they're gifting it more. Maybe they're doing more since they're on their own. It's always it's always higher than what people think. And even if it was the 75% that people say, you don't want to pay a higher tax rate than you need to, right? So if you've not been laying the tax code on your ret retirement income situation, this is another reason why you want to start doing that. You know, Take advantage of these married filing jointly brackets. Okay, now... I know a lot of times at this point, people feel like, oh, wow, he just covered a lot of stuff. Sometimes people are like, hey, you know, I already had a high level view of a lot of this. But if you don't have the tools, it doesn't really matter, right? <clears throat> you might be able to do a periphery of some stuff, but you're not going to be able to go down in the weeds and do a really good job. But, uh, and that's, you know, maybe you're sitting there wondering, you know, maybe he can't impart enough value or they can't impart enough value that's going to make a difference in my retirement income situation. And maybe you're right. But I can tell you from what I've seen, if you, if you set up a tax clarity visit, there's probably definitely something you're going to take away from that that's going to be educational and valuable to you. And of course, you know, we're very low pressure at my firm. We want to help everybody that wants to help, but people don't see the value in it. That's fine. We'll part ways as friends. But <clears throat> what I would like to do, again, is offer you the tax clarity visit. Um, take it, uh, Click that button there and, and, and on the tax clarity visit and pick a time on our schedule that's convenient for you. And 
what second we're going to get together and we're going to talk about your situation. And then if you want us to put together a tax map, the tax report, and maybe a little uh, financial summary for you, we absolutely will. <clears throat> because again, at the end of the day, the tax code is actual tax code, right? It's not an opinion. It's not an option. It's something that we have to do, right? This isn't about one advisor looking at another advisor's mutual funds or ETFs or investments and saying, ah, oh, my investments can beat yours, right? We're all going to be able to set you up if worth, worth our salt with keeping up the retirement, rising cost of retirement, right? Over time. There's no guarantees every year, but over time, um, but basically what this is, is laying the tax code on top of your retirement income situation and making sure the stuff that you can actually move the needle with, limiting your lifetime tax liability is taken full advantage of, right? So again, thank you very much for showing up today. I actually, like I said, I love doing these. I love to educate and inform. And um, I have a lot of knowledge um, on this topic. So I love imparting uh, some of that knowledge onto you. Hopefully you found this educational and informative. I highly recommend that you take care, take advantage of the, sitting down with uh, uh, me, a, a fiduciary certified financial planner and taking advantage of that 30 minute tax visit. And then we can go from there. We talk about that when you ask your questions and if you want to take steps forward, perfect. If not, you want to part ways as friends, no problem. Like I said, very low pressure. If you see the value in it, perfect. We believe you will. Not everybody does. Some people see the value and they still procrastinate. But the fact that you are here means that you are more of a doer than a procrastinator or an action taker. So take that action, schedule that visit. And again, thank you very much for showing up today. I hope you found, found it again, educational and informative, and I look forward to seeing you in the tax clarity visit. Thank you.